Hey there, my name is Tyler Summer, and in this video I'm going to talk about coronaviruses. Specifically, I'm going to talk about what the World Health Organization is calling the 2019 novel coronavirus. I'll talk about its possible origin, transmission, signs and symptoms of the disease, as well as thoughts on prevention and treatment. I'm also going to talk about some of the epidemic numbers as of January 30th, 2020. But real quick before I get started, please take a moment to hit subscribe, hit that little bell, and turn on notifications so you get a notification every time I upload a new video. All right, let's get started. So a common question that's being asked around the world right now with this outbreak occurring is, well, what is, a, what is the coronavirus? Now, the coronaviruses actually are a group of viruses that can affect animals and humans. They're a form of an enveloped virus, which means the protein casing that houses the genetic material of the virus is surrounded by a phospholipid membrane that is very similar to the membrane of a human cell. We also know coronaviruses are an, a type of RNA virus. Now in this extremely simplified drawing of an enveloped virus that I've put here on the slide, you can see that uh, inside an enveloped virus is a protein capsid represented by the cube. And inside that capsid is the genetic material, in this case an RNA strand. Surrounding this capsid is this envelope, which is a phospholipid bilayer, studded with several types of glycoproteins. The coronavirus is actually named, derived from a Latin word called corona, which actually means a crown or halo. And the electron microscope images of the coronavirus look sort of like a crown or a halo. There are several different types of envelope viruses, including herpes viruses, pox viruses, and even HIV. While there are dozens and dozens, maybe even hundreds of different types of coronaviruses that affect animals all over the world, there are seven types of coronaviruses that we know of that can affect humans. And they actually all cause respiratory tract infections. We've known about some of these since the 1960s. People around the world actually contract these coronaviruses all the time, and for most, of, most people it causes just a common cold. Four of these seven actually cause common colds, along with other types of viruses that cause common colds like rhinoviruses and parainfluenza. So really, coronaviruses are nothing new to us. But as you'll see, this new 2019 novel coronavirus is something new. Now, two of the seven coronaviruses have been known for a while now and actually cause more of a serious respiratory disease than just a simple common cold. One of these is known as the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, also known as SARS. You re may remember that back in 2002 and 2003, there was an outbreak in China of the SARS virus that actually affected more than 8,000 people. And of those 8,000, there were 774 people that actually died. Fortunately, there have no, been no reported cases since 2004, according to the CDC in the United States. Another type of coronavirus is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, also known as MERS. MERS was first reported in 2012 and continues to be a cause of infection in Saudi Arabia and other countries around the Arabian Peninsula. Interestingly and important to know is that both SARS and MERS seem to have emerged from the animal kingdom, meaning that the virus started as an animal virus, but then was able to infect humans around those infected animals. And then those infected humans were actually able to pass the virus to other humans. SARS is believed to come through bats and a type of cat that lives in China and other places in Asia and MERS came through camels. In late 2019, just a couple of months ago, a novel coronavirus emerged. Novel meaning new or unique. This is a new type of coronavirus that has not been previously identified, which is one of the big reasons it's so widely discussed in the media right now. This new virus is called currently the 2019 novel coronavirus, although I'm anticipating that it will have a name change at some point in the future because it can't always be called the novel coronavirus. So this is a new version of the coronavirus that likely started in an animal source, just like SARS and MERS, but is now apparently spreading from human to human as well. 
genetic analysis has actually revealed that it likely emerged from a virus that is genetically related to SARS. It's not a new form of SARS, but it's somewhat genetically related, according to officials. This novel virus seems to have originated in the area of Wuhan City in China. Currently, there are thousands of people affected by this virus in Wuhan City, and the Chinese officials have placed potentially millions of people on quarantine in an attempt to control the outbreak. The WHO believes that the first individuals to have contracted the infection likely became infected in November 2019. Chinese officials identified the new virus in December 2019, and the WHO named it the 2019 novel coronavirus at the end of December. This outbreak has become an international concern with affected individuals in several different countries at this point. And as of just yesterday, the WHO has officially declared a global health emergency. So a huge question that so many people are asking right now is, how is this transmitted and how can I prevent this from affecting me? That's still largely unknown at this point and under ongoing investigation. Based on what was observed with MERS and SARS, it's suspected that this 2019 NCOV can spread via respiratory droplet similar to the way a common cold is spread, also similar to influenza. So coughing, sneezing, generally between those people who are within close contact with each other. Respiratory droplet is different than airborne transmission, like we see with conditions like tuberculosis. For those spread by respiratory droplet, transmission generally has to occur within a close vicinity to another person. Again, this is still under ongoing investigation, and officials haven't made a formal statement on how transmission occurs. So how many confirmed cases of this new virus are we talking about? The number is going up each day, unfortunately, but officials and international organizations across the world are trying hard to contain the outbreak. As of January 30th, 2020, more than 8,230 confirmed cases in 22 countries exist. Obviously, this includes China, but also includes places like India, Australia, the United States, the Philippines, and many other nations. Also, as of January 30th, 2020, 214 individuals have actually passed away from this infection so far. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention here in the United States is monitoring cases in the United States and abroad in conjunction with the WHO and several other international organizations. Again, as of January 30th, 2020, in the United States, there are 166 American patients who are under investigation with six individuals currently testing positive for the virus, 68 who have tested negative, and 92 individuals are still waiting on their test results. The first five cases in the United States had all recently traveled to the area of Wuhan City. However, on January 30th, the CDC did confirm the first case of person-to-person -person transmission on U.S. soil, case number six. In this case, the individual is the spouse of one of the first five, as of right now, all of the cases here in the United States have been described or reported as, quote, mild. Unfortunately, this is not the case in other parts of the world, and people are dying from this infection. So what are the signs and symptoms? How does a patient present when they're sick with this novel coronavirus? Now, of those thousands of individuals that have been confirmed testing positive for the virus, the clinical presentation is varying widely from mildly ill with a simple upper respiratory infection all the way to significant lower pulmonary infection with acute respiratory failure and death. Symptoms can include fever, cough, and shortness of breath. So how about treatment? What about those people that have been officially diagnosed with this novel coronavirus? At this time, there are no current recommendations of antiviral medications used to treat this virus. Supportive care, though, is the mainstay of treatment, and the supportive care is directed at alleviating symptoms, so such things as antipyretic medications to decrease fever. For severe cases such as those that progress to acute respiratory distress syndrome, care is generally focused at supporting vital organ function and hemodynamic perfusion. These are the patients that generally have a poorer prognosis. Well then, what about prevention? Currently, there's no vaccine available for the novel coronavirus. 
So our prevention efforts should be aimed at those same efforts that we would use to help prevent other types of respiratory viruses. This includes washing our hands with soap and water, avoid touching our face with unwashed hands, staying home when we're feeling sick and avoiding contact with others, avoiding contact with those who are sick, and covering sneezes and coughs and disinfecting objects or surface areas around us. So an important question that providers need to make sure they understand is do we need to report suspected cases of this novel coronavirus? The answer is absolutely yes. International organizations around the world are working very hard to control this outbreak and are relying on clinicians throughout the world to help in that effort. If providers suspect that one of their patients may actually have this novel virus, they should notify the infection control person at their facility right away and local or state health departments so that national organizations can get involved. In the United States, the CDC works closely with the state and local health departments to not only monitor those patients who are under investigation, but to help coordinate the collection, storage, and shipment of specimens necessary for testing and diagnostic purposes. So I've been asked this question by many people lately, are we overreacting? I would say it's too early for us to answer that question, are we overreacting? With any significant outbreak of a new virus that seems to be a new and potentially deadly virus, reacting the way the WHO and other international organizations have reacted is completely appropriate. It's really important for us to keep a close eye on this 2019 novel coronavirus outbreak, and hopefully it's going to end really soon. The CDC is predicting that the numbers within the United States will increase but they and other international organizations are working around the clock to monitor it closely and try to prevent further spread. That being said, at this point, at this point in this outbreak, the influenza virus is a more worrisome threat around the world. Just using CDC data pertaining to the United States, just since October 1st, 2019, around 200,000 Americans have already been hospitalized for influenza. Additionally, we've already lost about 10,000 Americans due to the influenza virus. So what's the bigger threat that we're dealing with right now? Probably influenza, and we need to do everything we can to prevent transmission of this virus at this time, using those same methods I just discussed a moment ago, as well as a vaccination, which can be pretty effective. So don't forget to wash your hands, cover your coughs, cover your sneezes, and let's let the international organizations keep an eye on this outbreak for us. All right, well that finishes up this video. Thanks for watching. I hope you found it helpful. Again, please take a minute and hit subscribe. I do plan to do a couple of update videos on the coronavirus as this outbreak is continually watched by the WHO and the CDC and other organizations around the world. If you're subscribed and have the notifications turned on, you'll get an email when I do post a new video. Thanks for watching.